Hi y'all, my name is Tyler. I am the events coordinator here at Holiday Lake and today we're going to talk about some herpetology. So in order to talk about herpetology, we need to know what herpetology is about. So we can break it down into two different parts. So we can break it down into herpeta and ology. So we know that ology is the study of. And you'll have to excuse my handwriting. It's pretty bad, but you'll get used to it. Ignore that. Herpeta means reptiles, and there's one more part, amphibians. So, what I like to do to start is I like to list some reptiles and amphibians so we have a better idea of what we're talking about. So we can start with amphibians, and I will abbreviate it ampha, because ampha doesn't really show up in reptiles. So some examples of amphibians that we want to talk about are going to be frogs, ugly frogs, also known as toads, and then we also have salamanders. Now, some salamanders are newts, but not all newts are salamanders, so we can make them all one group as salamanders. These are the main three things that we want to think about when we think about amphibians. Now, when we have reptiles, which I'll, I will abbreviate R-E-P-T, we're thinking about things like snakes. We're also thinking about turtles. We're thinking about big reptiles like alligators and crocodiles. We're also thinking about things like lizards. So now that we have these animals in mind when we're talking about reptiles and amphibians, we can go ahead and start breaking down which each group contain. So when we're talking about amphibians, we want to talk about some core characteristics that make amphibians amphibians. So again, when we're thinking about amphibians, we're thinking about things like salamanders, frogs, toads, newts, and things like that. So one of the first things that we want to establish is whether they have bones or not. And if they do have bones, do they have a backbone? Well, in fact, if you think about how a frog moves, it would have to have a backbone in order to jump and move around the way it does. So when an animal has a backbone, it's called a vertebrate. So now we know that amphibians are all vertebrates. Another core characteristic we want to think about is whether amphibians are cold-blooded or warm-blooded. And the difference between warm-blooded and cold-blooded is if an animal or organism can make its own body heat and regulate its body temperature. We, as mammals, are warm-blooded. That means that we can regulate our body temperature. We can regulate our heat. And the way we do that is we take the food that we consume, we take that food and turn it into heat. We, turn, we take chemical energy and turn it into thermal energy. Now, things that are cold-blooded don't have those characteristics. They don't have the ability to make their own heat. So in order to regulate their body temperature, if they want to warm up, they go out in the sun or they bask on a rock that was out in the sun, say if the sun is down but the rock is still warm. And if they want to cool down, they do what we do. They go in the shade or sometimes they even go into the water. So we know that amphibians are cold-blooded. This is another key characteristic that we want to think about when we're thinking about amphibians. Now, we also want to think about how they procreate. So how do amphibians make more amphibians? Do they give live birth or do they lay eggs? So we know that amphibians lay eggs. But they're not quite like chicken eggs. They're more so jelly-like. If you've ever had boba tea or you know what Orbeez are, they're very close to the consistency of Orbeez and boba tea. So next time you go get boba tea, just think about amphibian eggs and you'll enjoy it that much more. So we can go ahead and uh, we know that amphibians lay eggs, but they're not like chicken eggs. That's the biggest thing that we want to take away from is they lay eggs and they are jelly-like. Awesome. So another thing we want to think about is the skin. What is the skin of an amphibian like? Is it scaly? Is it dry? Not often do you find a scaly and dry amphibian. Now you might think about a toad is dry, but it still doesn't have scales. So when we think about frogs, we think about a smooth, most of the time, moist skin. So 
That is a characteristic that a lot of amphibians share, is that they have smooth, moist skin. All right. Uh, so another thing that we want to think about uh, when we're thinking about amphibians is where they live. Where can you find amphibians? And so when we think about the word amphibious, which is a derivative of amphibian, it's all in the same family. Amphibians and things that are amphibious are found on land and water, which makes a lot of sense because you can find frogs in the water or you can find them on land. And a lot of times with amphibians, you, they spend one part of their life cycle either in or near the water and another part on land or the other way around. Some of them can start on land or mostly terrestrial is what we call it, and they can end up in the water. Um, so we like to think of amphibians as on land and water. And so the last point that we want to bring up is we want to think about living things need to breathe. They need to bring oxygen into their systems. So we want to think about how amphibians breathe. So a lot of amphibians start their life cycles as small tadpoles or little nymphs or things like that. Small things that end up transforming into the adult. A lot of times what you will find as these things, like tadpoles, live completely underwater, they have gills. That's how they breathe. They breathe almost like fish. But as they get older, they end up developing their lungs and they breathe air with lungs. So, a lot of times you can think of the adult amphibians breathe with lungs and a good amount of the time the juvenile amphibians uh, usually breathe with gills or something like that. But there are also cases of amphibians that breathe with gills. So that's the last thing that we want to think about is they have lungs and or gills at different stages of their life. And or gills. So as a review of amphibians, we have, they are vertebrates, meaning they have backbones. They are cold-blooded, which means they can't regulate their body temperature. They lay eggs, which are jelly-like. They're not like chicken eggs. They have smooth, moist skin, which they don't shed. They keep it. They grow with it. Um, and they, you can find them on land and water. And they also have lungs and or gills, depending on which life cycle or which stage of their life that they're at. So now we can talk about reptiles, which is one of my favorite parts of herpetology because we've got so many cool examples to show you. So with reptiles, we want to start outlining some of those characteristics like we talked about before with the amphibians. So the first thing we want to talk about is bone structure. Do reptiles have bones? So we can think about turtles. Turtles are one of the great examples to get you into the rest of the reptiles. So with turtles, turtles have bones. We know they have bones because they have legs. They walk around, okay? In order to walk around, you kind of need legs, all right? So we know that turtles have bones, but do turtles have backbones? That is the real question. And we know that turtles have backbones because turtles are connected to their shells. They have complete control over their shells. And the way we know that is because turtles have backbones that are connected to their shells. So we can see here that this is a backbone connected directly to the turtle shell, which actually makes a lot of sense. Because have you ever seen a turtle in real life, not in Over the Hedge or any other cartoon? Have you ever seen a turtle outside of its shell? No, it's because they are directly connected to their shell. It's a very important part of their body. So now we know that reptiles have backbones, which makes them vertebrates. Now let's think about their skin. When we think about reptiles, again, we're thinking about turtles, lizards, snakes, things like that. Um, we think of scales. We think of dry skin, and that's, you, that's pretty much what you're going to find with reptiles. Now with snakes and lizards and things like that, we know that they shed. And we have great examples like this. This right here is a snake skin that has been shed. And the reason the reptiles shed their skin is so that they can grow. They don't grow with their skin like we do or how amphibians do. 
they shed the outer layer of skin so they can grow. But when you think to yourself, well, turtles are reptiles, right? Do turtles shed? Well, yes, they do shed, and I'll show you how. So here, in this bag, I've got what we call scoots. Scoots are sections off of a turtle shell that they pop off in order to grow the shell more. Because, you know, big turtles don't start as big turtles. They have to grow, right? So they pop off these little bitty pieces of their shell, and they grow just like any other reptile would. So now we know that reptiles have dry skin that sheds. Awesome. So how do reptiles make more reptiles? Do they give live birth? Do they lay eggs? Well, we know that they lay eggs for the most part. There are a couple examples where reptiles give live birth, but they're very few and far between. The majority of reptiles lay eggs, but they're not quite like chicken eggs, and they're not quite like amphibian eggs. They're more leathery. They're, they're resilient. And the reason they do that is so that they can withstand being packed together because reptiles often lay a lot of eggs together and they're bouncing off of each other and things like that. So we know that reptiles lay eggs and they are leathery. Awesome. So the next thing that we want to talk about is how reptiles breathe. So how do reptiles breathe? Have you ever seen a snake with gills? Probably not. Most reptiles have two lungs, one functional lung and one what we call a vestigial lung. This vestigial lung isn't as functional as the actual primary respiratory lung, which means how they breathe. So reptiles in general have lungs. You think about turtles. Turtles have to come up to the water, come up to the surface of the water if they're in the water to breathe, right? We think about lizards. Lizards live out on land most of the time. That means that they breathe air. So we know the reptiles have lungs. So the last thing that we want to talk about is whether reptiles are warm-blooded or cold-blooded. Now, we know that reptiles are cold-blooded, again, meaning that they cannot regulate their body temperature. They cannot create their own heat. That's why you see a lot of times in the cooler evenings, you will see a snake on the road is because that road has trapped that heat from the sun during the day and it is absorbing that heat from the road. Um, this means that it's cold-blooded. It's trying to raise its body temperature. And a lot of times on a really hot day, you won't find reptiles out in the sun. You'll find them in the shade. They're trying to cool off. So now we know that reptiles are cold-blooded. So as a review, we see that reptiles are vertebrates, meaning that they have backbones, they have dry skin that they shed, and we can see that with things like snake skins and sheds like that. Um, they lay eggs that are leathery. They're not like chicken eggs, but they're also not like amphibian eggs. We know that they have, they breathe with lungs and that they are cold blooded, meaning they cannot regulate their body temperature. So what I'm going to do now is going to grab a couple friends and show you some examples of what we're talking about. This is my buddy Jim. Jim is a box turtle. Box turtles are really cool because they're the only turtles that can actually fully enclose themselves in, within their shells. And the reason that they can do that is because Jim, like his friend here, who's no longer with us, has this little hinge on the bottom of his shell. And that means that he can close it up. So if something's bothering Jim, uh, he can close himself up completely within his shell so nobody can bother him. Now we know that Jim is a male because Jim has some really colorful markings. And the reason that we know that males are colorful is because they're trying to attract a mate. If I want to go and try to attract a mate, I'm going to put on my Sunday's best. I'm not rolling out of the house with sweatpants and camo crocs. I'm going to be wearing something nice, something like a nice button-up shirt. And I want to make sure I wear my nice shoes and things like that. This color on Jim are Jim's nice shoes and his button-up. We can also tell that Jim is a male because Jim has an indentation on the bottom of his shell which helps him to mate. So Jim is really cool. Jim has a backbone because as we saw before, Jim's 
backbone is connected to his shell. Jim sheds these little pieces off of his shell called scoots so he may grow. Uh, Jim is cold-blooded. Jim does have dry skin. Uh, and also Jim breathes with lungs. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab another friend and I will bring them to you and I'll show you. This is my friend Bob. Bob is what we call a corn snake. He's called a corn snake for a couple different reasons. So as you can see, what I'll show you, if Bob will not tie himself in a knot, uh, this underbelly of Bob kind of looks like that festive corn that you'll see in the fall. Also, another thing about Bob is Bob is found in cornfields. Um, and so the reason Bob's found in cornfields is because Bob eats things like mice, and mice are in cornfields because mice eat corn. So mice eat corn, Bob eat mice, farmer likes Bob. So if a farmer finds Bob in his field, he's not going to be upset because he knows Bob is helping out. Uh, Bob is also a reptile, and Bob, since he's a reptile, is a vertebrate, meaning he has a backbone. And snakes have super long backbones, um, essentially going down to their tail. So a snake's tail, see on Bob, starts about right there. That's where his tail starts. That's all the tail that Bob has. The rest of it from his head to his tail is pretty much a backbone. Um, so Bob has a backbone. That's how he can move the way that he does. Uh, Bob is cold-blooded, so he likes to be warm. That's why he likes to kind of find the warm places. If you hold a snake, they might try to gravitate towards your armpits if they're a little cold. Um, things like that. Uh, Bob is also, he breathes with a lung, with his regular lung, and then he has that vestigial lung. Um, and then Bob is also found on land. He has dry skin that he sheds because we've seen the snake sheds. Uh, so Bob is a really, really cool dude because he's got some really cool color. Um, and one thing that we want to talk about when we talk about snakes is how they eat. Snakes, uh, typically they eat their prey whole. And the way that Bob does that is that he has a two-hinged jaw. A lot of people think that snakes dislocate their jaw in order to open up and eat their prey, but they actually have two hinges that move on two different levels to open up as far as possible. So Bob will eat his prey whole, and then he will poop it out. Reptiles poop, just like we do, except for girls. Girls don't poop, that's a fact. Um, but Bob has what we call a cloaca. And so in the cloaca, that is where if Bob were a girl, he would lay his eggs. That's where Bob reproduces, and that's also where Bob gets rid of his waste. Which is super cool about reptiles is they have an all-purpose uh, orifice that gets the job done. Another thing that you'll see with Bob is he's got this little smelly flicker, his tongue. He's always sticking his tongue out. And the reason that Bob does that is because he's smelling. That's how snakes smell. They don't smell with their nose. Um, so Bob is sticking his tongue out, and his tongue is forked. It has two little ends to it. And the reason it's forked is so Bob can smell which direction things are. If he smells something that he really likes, he'll know which way to go from that. So Bob's really cool, and when we think about reptiles, we want to think about all of these characteristics, whether it be a snake or an alligator or a turtle or a lizard, anything like that. All of these core characteristics are going to apply to your reptiles. So in review, when we talk about reptiles and amphibians, we want to think about the characteristics that they share. Things like they're both vertebrates, they both lay eggs, they're both cold-blooded. But remember, they also have differences. Things like their eggs are different. Remember, amphibian eggs are jelly-like, and reptile eggs are leathery. Also, you can find that reptiles have dry skin that they shed, but amphibians have smooth, moist skin that they keep for their whole life, so they grow with. And another part that we want to think about is how amphibians are found both on land and water, which makes them amphibious. Thank you all so much for watching with us and learning with us. We hope that you learned a bunch. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact us, and we'd be glad to answer whatever you have.